Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Auction for the Soul. This week's parsha is Parashat Lech Lecha. Um, the parsha begins in a very different way than the previous parsha. Parshat Noach begins with a nice introduction, telling us that Noach was a uh, tzaddik, uh, tamim v'dorotav, a little bit of an intro. And this week's parsha, Parsha Noach, zero introduction, just Lech Lecha, go, no explanation as to who... Um, Abraham is, or where he's coming from, or where he's going, no mention of his destination at all. And uh, we take it for granted. We read the parasha, we know the story of Abraham, we know the story of him leaving his homeland, leaving his family behind, um, but we don't really know enough about his backstory. His backstory is brought down, brought down in the Midrashim, and uh, the Midrashim tell us that uh, his mother, Amtalia, a name that most people are not familiar with, she uh, gave birth to Avraham outside of the city walls that uh, he and his family were uh, born in, uh, a place called Ur Kazdim. Ur Kazdim is the place where the furnace that was being used to build the tower, the famed Tower of Babel, Tower of Babel. And um, she was uh, part of an elite class of people, the very wealthy uh, patricians, the upper class, the people that live on top of the mountain. Um, and uh, was very educated. The word Amtalia comes from the word Amtala, a logical proof. And she rejects this decree that was made by Nimrod himself, the king, the self-proclaimed king, that states that every boy that will be born in this year, the year that they were that was there, uh, that they were in, that every baby boy that is born should be set to fire and sacrificed by to the god of Molach, the, the god of fire. Um, and she rejects this idea. She uh, I re- completely rejects this notion of, uh, of, of child sacrifice, of infanticide for a deity. And um, she gives birth to him quietly in private away from the city and the town. She raises him outside, not too far from the desert. Avraham is uh, taught, uh, imagine philosophical inquiry by her, his mother. Uh, she is the source of so much of his wisdom and his uh, um, inquisitive nature. Um, so Abraham is, the Midrash tells us, is born outside of the city, and um, he has all kinds of questions. And the one thing that he recognizes on his own is that the world is a world of chaos. And in a world of chaos, um, why does order exist? Why do we have order? Why does the sun work in tandem with the planet? Why does the planet work in tandem with everything inside of it constantly moving, providing, creating something called life. There should be none of that. None of that should exist. But the fact that you and I live in a world where all of our needs are being nurtured immediately, right? We're not even thinking about it, that the trees are producing the oxygen that we need to breathe, that our carbon dioxide that we express, the trees are ingesting and converting the oxygen, that we are living in a perfect system for life. It's something that Abraham sees, that Abraham sees and says, this must be divine, this must be godly. And he, he, he rejects the idea of, uh, of polytheism. He rejects the uh, pantheon of gods theory that, oh, there are a bunch of gods that were warring and they went ahead and created the earth. No, he says that when you have this kind of symmetry on earth, this amount of design, of unison, of harmony, there must be a unifying force that's pulling it all together. And this is how he comes to his conclusion of monotheism. Now, we have to be mindful that Abraham lived during the time of Noah. Noah was still alive when Abraham was around. Um, there are plenty of people that um, Abraham, Abraham could have spoken to to find out about God. He could have gone to the yeshiva of Shem and Ever. There was a, uh, a place where, where there were some kind of spiritual studies happening uh, in the world, but he did not have access to this. And he comes to these conclusions on his own, away from Noah and his tradition and his children's tradition. He's born away from society. He's born to a society that's already been corrupted, a society whose values he rejects on his own. That requires a tremendous amount of strength, tremendous amount of, of confidence and a, uh, maybe even a philosophical discipline, being able to withstand uh, the pressure from the outside world. He gets arrested by his father. His father sets him, puts, arrests him for destroying the idols, as you may famously know. Um, and um, he's questioned as to what he actually believes in, and Nimrod the king says to him, all you have to do is worship one of your deities, your dad's my good friend, and I'll let you and your family go. Abraham rejects it, saying, you know, uh, how could I worship any one god? You want me to worship the sun? And Nimrod's like, yeah, worship the sun. And he says, okay, well, 
well, why should I worship the sun if the, if the, if the, if the clouds can block out the, the, uh, the sun's rays? He says, okay, that's a good point. Worship the, the clouds. He's like, but the wind can blow the clouds, and then the mountains could block the, the, the wind and the, and the oceans. And he keeps breaking down that, you know, it's impossible to have any one force that's truly in control and in power, which was his way of saying to the king, you're not the unifying power either. Rejecting, rejecting the monarchy, rejecting uh, the uh, pantheism, the, uh, the idea of there being uh, the polytheism. Um, he is on his own, cast into the fire. He survives. His brother, Abraham, has two brothers, Haran and Nahor. Um, and Haran is the middle child who's standing idly by on the sidelines, waiting to see what happens with Abraham. And he says, I want to do what Abraham does. I, I believe in the God of Abraham. He's thrown into the fire and he dies. And the question is, why? Why? Do those fires consume him? And why is Abraham protected? <coughs> now, I'm not sure if you're following what's happening in the news. Um, uh, the last couple of weeks, there's a, a famous uh, rapper, a uh, singer, you know, a, a designer named Kanye West. Kanye West went on his uh, anti-Semitic tirade this last couple of uh, weeks, saying that Jews control the media and that uh, you know, where you know, all kinds of very clear anti-Semitic remarks coming from Kanye West, and plenty of people have given him, gave him the opportunity to retract, and he just doubles down. And we see how this created a, uh, a watershed moment in, uh, in, in American history, where all these anti-Semites are coming out, explicitly you know, speaking about anti-Semitism, floating anti-Semitic movies, this has happened in the NBA, the NFL, and a whole bunch of other places, people supporting Kanye, uh, people agreeing with Kanye, um, so I'm going to share with you a true story. This happened to me on um, this happened to me on Tuesday, Tuesday um, afternoon around two o'clock. This Manhattan. I am walking out of a meeting in a WeWork on 59th off Park. I'm walking up 59th Street, walking towards uh, Madison, and I could see from the corner of my eye a uh, someone is trying to catch up to me. You know, and they they catch up to me, and um, they are. Um, standing alongside me, and uh, it's a black man. He sticks out his hand, and he wants to shake my hand, and I stick out my hand, I keep walking, and he says, are you Jewish? And I say, yes, I am Jewish. And he says to me with a smile, uh, is it true that the Jews control the media? I'm like, what? So I ignored the guy, and I kept walking. He says, no, no, no. He's like, listen, he's like, you know, I just, I just want to... Uh, I want to. I want to. Um, I want to. I want to buy a yarmulke. Where can I buy a yarmulke? He says. So I'm like, oh, you can go buy a yarmulke any in any Jewish bookstore. Not a problem. Go ahead and buy yourself a yarmulke. And then um, he says to me, well, can you just can you tell me where these Jewish bookstores are? I'm like, you could find them. They're all over the place. So he's like, can you take me to one of these Jewish bookstores and buy me a yarmulke? And I said to him, you can figure it out, have a nice day. And I crossed the corner and we separated ways. And that was, it was probably the most passive, aggressive, anti-Semitic uh, moment I've ever experienced. And I, I imagine that uh, this is something that's definitely not going to be reported. Like, I'm not calling the police and say, this was an anti-Semitic uh, moment. You know, <laughs> please find this guy. These are, these are the types of anti-Semitic uh, instances that are not recorded. And even though we know since Kanye West's rant, on, against Jews, anti-Semitism has gone up by 2,000%. Um, I guarantee you these are the things that are not being recorded. And it's interesting because when we think about Lech Lecha, a parsha that does not give any introduction to uh, Abraham because he needs no introduction, he needs no instruction as to where his journey begins because the Torah makes it very clear, Lech Lecha, take a journey into the self, right? We know that the, 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 uh, a journey of a million miles begins with the first step. But where is he going? What does it mean to just go? If I told you, you know, just leave and you'll figure out where the wedding is, you're not going to arrive. So where is he going? What is this parasha asking him to do? What is God even telling him to do? How does he even have the ability to maintain this level of belief? Yom Hashem Abraham. God says to Abraham, Lech lecha, go for or to yourself. Me'atzecha, from your land. Umulatecha, from your relatives. Umbeit avicha, from the house of your father. El, to ha'aretz asher areka, to the land that I will show you. And then it says more. It says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you, make your name great. Vahaya. Beracha, and you shall be a blessing. 
Vavarcha, and I will bless Mavarecha, those who bless you, Makalcha Aor, and those who curse you, I will curse. And I'm confident that God will curse those that try to go ahead and curse us. Venevrachu Bachab Kol Mishbachuat Adama, and all blessing will go through you. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. You will be blessed. But there's a condition over here almost, right? There has to be an expression of an individual who expresses the truest version of himself. How many of us are truly expressing who we are at our core versus the way we were molded by our families, community, homeland, culture, friendships? How many of us have a vision in our mind's eye of what it means to truly be the best us? Lech lecha, who are you? When you're going off on a journey on land, it's very easy. You have you know, all kinds of uh, signs and road signs, posts, you have uh, landmarks, you have an idea where you're going, you would see footsteps where people traveled. But when you're traveling in an ocean, right? There's no, every piece of water looks exactly the same. There's no landmarks, you have no idea where you're going, right? Even if someone sailed that sea a thousand times over and over again, you have no idea what, what, which path they took, there's nothing there. The word for I is ani. The word for a boat in Hebrew is oniya. There's a correlation there. There's a relationship there. To be yourself means not looking outside. It means not taking the, uh, the, uh, the posts, the signposts that are around you to define who you are. You're on your own. And when you could truly be by yourself, Abraham, that's when you will be an expression of greatness. The reason why anti-Semites have such a hard time with the Jews, I believe, is because sometimes Jews do not express the best version of themselves, right? And I could see how now so many students have told me, Rabbi, you know, I was at on campus at on Baruch on, um, on Wednesday, and there was an uh, incident on campus where someone sprayed a swastika in the bathroom. There's a, 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 a mitzvah truck right near uh, the, uh, what's it called, 14th Street, which was graffitied, and they wrote, you know, Free Palestine on it. I don't know what that has to do with what's happening here, you know? But you see that these are things that are happening in this country right now. And the question is, well, what's the response? You know, and I, I, I think for many people, it's, many people are stuck. They don't really have the ability to defend what they believe in. There's an intuition of Judaism being true. There's something here. It's special. It's unique. It's amazing. But they can't really speak about what it means to be Jewish. There's no real way of articulating the why, the how. And Avraham Avinu was forced to be put into a situation where he had to articulate it. He had to come to grips with, well, what does it mean? What is this Jewish journey about? How am I expressing this stuff? How am I sharing? Am I willing to fight and die for my beliefs? And I truly feel this way. If we today are going to, how are we going to face anti-Semitism? I'm not going to face anti-Semitism by wearing a baseball cap. That's not going to help the situation. I'm going to keep wearing my kippah. I'm going to keep speaking as I do. I'm going to keep being an individual who's working very deeply and being a better human being, being a better son, being a better community member. You know, I find it interesting that so many of these people make these ridiculous claims that the Jews control the media. It's, it's such baloney because if we controlled the media, there would be none of this anti-Israel bias in the media. If we controlled the media and we're so powerful, why, how did we allow the Nazis to kill six million Jews? Throughout history, if there was this cabal of Jews running things, why were the Jews always the ones getting in trouble? It makes no sense. Yes, there are Jews that are successful, and yes, there are plenty of Jews that are poor. Yes, there are Jews that are able to do amazing things, just, and there are plenty of Jews that do horrible things. And that's fine. That's human beings. To generalize is to destroy. But Abraham understands that people are always going to generalize. They called him a sterile, a, a, a barren mule. They made fun of him. He's going to die with his beliefs. Everything will end with Abraham. There will be nothing beyond him. But... What makes Abraham so profoundly powerful is his steadfast commitment to his ideas. God promises him a, a great name. God promises him children that as numerous as the stars, wealth. Does he see all of that? The answer is no. He, his son, and he has two kids, Ishmael, definitely not walking in the, in the footsteps of his father, of Abraham. He has another kid, Isaac, who we know is 37 and still living at home and not married, right? There's a shidduch crisis happening with the first Jew. Um, he's, he doesn't have a homeland. We know later that you know, he has no place to bury his, his wife. It's, it's embarrassing. 
He was promised land, fame, and he has nothing. So how does he still believe? Would you still believe if you were all these promises were made and yet you still do not see these things come to fruition? And the answer is, is that what makes Abraham so great is he recognizes the true journey, the true blessing, is when an individual is able to go into the deepest recesses of the self and express greatness, working through the world that you and I were born into and choosing something profound. But we don't prevent us. I'll give you a story. There is a, uh, a soldier that was caught behind enemy lines. And the captain that captures him says, listen, you know, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be death by firing squad tomorrow morning at six o'clock. You're going to die. So the soldier says, listen, you know, um, you know, so the captain says, but you know what, I'll give you, I, I like you, I'll give you an option. There is a door um, that you open tomorrow morning at six o'clock. You could either face the firing squad or you go to this door. So and you, you go, and you know, so the soldier's like, what's behind the door? He's like, I have no idea what's behind the door. It's some unknown power. You have that choice. You could either walk behind the door or go to this uh, firing squad. You choose what you want to do. So the next morning, the guy wakes up, the soldier, and he says, I choose a firing squad. And he's executed. So this captain has a, uh, this uh, lieutenant who's in there. He says, Captain, he says, you know, like I, every time you make this offer to these prisoners, they always choose the firing squad. Why? So he says, people would rather choose certain death then, traveling to the unknown. We would much rather do something that is tangible and familiar than try to do something that is so unknown. And this is where Abraham's greatness comes from. You want to know where the greatness of the Jewish people comes from? Is that we're not afraid to take those risks, those leaps of, of, of traversing into a place that has been unchartered. That is the greatness of Abraham. This time that we're in right now, I believe is like the... Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the end of, uh, or getting closer to the end of our Jewish history, it's going to demand a certain level of discipline, a certain level of commitment on our part. Are we willing and able and ready to delve deep into that unknown, the journey into the self? You want to find true success. You want to find the ability to uh, you know, uh, bring blessing into the world. It does not start outside of you. It begins inside of you. It begins within your heart and soul. This is why God does not need to, need to tell Abraham where to go. Lech first, lecha. And then you'll go from your house, your, uh, the place you were born, your, your family's home, and, and the land that you, were, you, were, you come from. Then you'll walk away. Then you'll get the clarity you need. Then you'll find the blessings that you need to go ahead and bless the earth with. There's a certain level of confidence you have to walk around with these days. And if you cannot express what your beliefs are, you will be lost to the history just like Haran was. Haran, Abraham's brother, is, was uh, the quintessential, I would say he's, like, he's most Jews today in the world. Haran is a Jew who is apathetic, indecisive, uncertain of himself. Maral points out that Haran's name right, is a, describes the essence of who he was. His name is made up of three letters, and each letter, the numerical value, represents a midway point. The letter He, five, is the midway point between one and ten. The letter Resh, 200, is the midway point between one and 400, 400 being Taf, the largest Hebrew letter. And the letter Nun is being the midway point between one and, sorry, Nun is 50, it's the midway point between one and 100. So he represents someone who is stuck, flatlined, right in the middle. Indecisiveness leads to destruction. Abraham's decisiveness is why he's able to withstand the, the fiery flames of that furnace that builds the Tower of Babel. Now, interestingly, we know from the Arizal that Haran actually, later in life, is a Gilgul, what we call, he's reincarnated into, into, into uh, someone very profound, into Aharon. You add an Aleph to Haran's name, it becomes Aharon. And the difference between Haran and Aharon is that one, that one letter, the one representing having a clear vision as to what my mission is here today. Abraham understood monotheism. He understood there's a system of perfection and growth and development that he was a part of. Aharon understood this. 
But Aaron's job is to be the guy that makes the balance between the physical world and the spiritual world. How we're able, we're supposed to take everything from the material world and elevate it into making something much more spiritual. That the holiest day of the year is our Shabbat. And Shabbat happens every single week, not Yom Kippur, not Pesach. Yom Kippur is Shabbat Shabbaton. Pesach is Kiyom Shabbat. Every day of the Jewish calendar is like Shabbat. The holidays are like Shabbat. Shabbat is the holiest day of the, Jew, of, of, of the year, every single week. How we tap into it, how we use it, oh well, you sit there and you're eating a steak and you're having wine, you're making kiddush, you're singing songs. So it's, it's very, it does not feel like a spiritual experience at all. But that's the conundrum that Jews always pose to the world. We are physical beings, yet we also have a soul. And therefore, our job is to nourish both. Shabbat is the constant reminder of that expression, that we're supposed to take the material and elevate it into something much more profound, spiritual, that we could take something called time and elevate it and make it spiritual. That's what Shabbat is. And I'm willing to fight for Shabbat. It's so obvious today how Shabbat is such a powerful, uh, you know, potent antidote to so much of the chaos in the world that we're living in right now. Because it has to do with your belief and your identity. And there is a, there's an identity and a part of you that needs to be expressed but is being blocked by the distractions of your society, environment, family, friends. And when you're able to find the courage to delve deeper into your beliefs, when you spend the time to, actually be, uh, to find a way to refine your speech, to articulate what you believe, it doesn't matter what the anti-Semites say. It doesn't matter what the world does or does not do because you will be an expression of the best of you. You will be a bracha. You will be the blessing that God says to Abraham. There's a reason why there's a correlation here in the verse. Go to yourself and you'll become a blessing. Any human being that really works on developing the best version of themselves ultimately is a blessing. That is what we say, Selem Elohim, an expression of God. That's why we're here. So Kanye West, I want to thank you so much for reminding me and all the people around me for creating an environment which helps me double down on my beliefs, double down on a group of people whose philosophy is love. Philosophy is to make the world a better place. And unfortunately, there are some Jews that lose this. It's only about the material, only about the stake on Shabbat and not about the elevating the stake and making it something more meaningful. But for Judaism and Jews, Certainly, uh, there is no control of the media. There is no control or, or Kabbalah power on the world. There's just a desire to make the world a bigger, better place. And if you're non-Jewish and you're watching this and you have friends who are telling you stories about them heckling Jews, make sure to discourage them. It's disgusting. Jews have to deal with a lot of other things. We don't need other people walking up to them and making them feel awkward and weird. I wish you all a Shabbat of health happiness, protection, but most importantly, a Shabbat where lech lecha, you have the time to go and delve deeper inside yourselves and spend the time to articulate what it means to be the best version of you. And when you do that, you'll be blessed with all the blessings of the Torah. Thank you so much for listening. Shabbat Shalom.